Welcome to the Super Bowl edition of Here We Go Cleveland podcast. I'm your host as always, Bill Hebel, and alongside me, the first subscriber to Tom vs. Time on Facebook, Mr. Spider2Y Banana himself, Mike Zappa. What's up? What's up? What's up, Bill? How you doing? Got a very special, this is like, you know, I just realized that now this is kind of a sad episode for us. It's the the official end of of the NFL season almost for everybody. Um, yeah, it's we've been out of it for uh, seems like months at this time at this point. So. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so in this week's episode, uh, Michael and I are going to dive into some recent mailbag questions from our dads. Is that right? Our dads, I guess so. They they I guess so. they fired up the old dial up and dove as deep as dads <laughs> can into their hot take bag to and fire some. Preface by saying some loaded questions. Yeah, great. Yes, questions. and truly, they did the they did the research. They got on Pro Football Focus and figured out how to log in and everything like that. Um, <laughs> and so we're gonna answer those. We got a question, a few questions from Owen too. He threw a couple curveballs at us. Um, but then we talk all things Super Bowl. But before we get into that, we have a very special guest. A Here we go, Cleveland exclusive. Uh, it, it's our first interview with Cincinnati Bengals tight end, uh, native Ohio, born and raised, Mason Shrek. Take us in, Dinosaurs Rex. Just get right into it. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, for those of you listening, um, this is a Here We Go Cleveland podcast exclusive interview with Mason Trek of the Cincinnati Bengals, um, plays tight end for them. So before we get into the the juicy interview questions, I want to ask you with the hit you with the most important one first. Are you going to be joining LeBron in, in Golden State this summer if he if he heads <laughs> out there? You know what? I honestly, just for the sake of being from Cleveland, I really hope he doesn't go out there. I, I, just personally, I think it's all rumors, and he's a smart guy, so I think he knows exactly what he's doing. And you know, hopefully, he'll stay in Cleveland. Yeah, I, I think I would go out there on the condition that I could get the account info to one of Durant's burner accounts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, he talked about you know he grew up in Medina, Ohio, which is a little bigger than. Uh, Shelby, where where Michael and I grew up, and uh, so so when did you start playing football? Um, I started playing when I was in third grade, um, and honestly, looking back, um, I had he was the guy who was my coach at the time. Is he really taught us the game the right way and brought us up the right way? And you know, I actually funny story is I hated football my first few weeks, and yeah, I actually told my mom that I you know I don't think I want to do this. This isn't for me, but um, yeah, just getting to know him and, you know, the program that I grew up playing in, it was great and surrounded by good people and ran the right way. And, um, you know, I, I never looked back from that. Yeah, that's great. So like I started playing basketball in third grade. Did you, you know, play other sports or like at that early of an age or? Yeah. So growing up, I played a lot of baseball, um, yeah, it was, it was baseball, football, basketball, and then I come from a golfing family. My dad and my brother are big golfers, so, um, you know, whenever I get the chance and growing up, I played a lot of golf as well. Nice. Um, so you played high school, or sorry, played quarterback in high school. Did that, I think I read that, you know, you played that all the way through high school. You were never, a, you know, you're a tight end now, but you were never a tight end in high school, right? Yeah, so I've, I was a quarterback basically my whole life. Um, and then, yeah, right before I got to college, they, uh, Buffalo actually wanted to switch my position. So, um, so my first year playing tight end was a freshman in college. Wow. So did that, did you want to play quarterback in college or did you kind of, you know, think that maybe tight end was the way to go to get in some places? Yeah, so all my, you know, my whole life I played quarterback. So, um, at first I was set in my mind that I wanted to play quarterback in college. Yeah. Um, so me and my dad went on a big camp circuit, 
um, my jun after my junior year of of high school football and um, you know I went to a lot of bigger schools and you know did a lot of running and a lot of throwing obviously and um, you know just participating in those camps and um, a lot of the schools saw me run and saw me move so well that they were a little hesitant to uh, you know offer me um, but they a lot of them had talked to me beforehand and said hey we will offer you or if uh, you know if you want to switch to tight end and I was so set in my mind that I wanted to play quarterback yeah um, and originally Buffalo had offered me to play quarterback and at the time I went to commit at that time they were my only division one offer and you know I was kind of prideful about myself and you know right. I want to play division one football so in order to do that I had to go to Buffalo and play a tight end so yeah so like I said my first day or my first time playing uh tight end was at Buffalo you know going against Khalil Mack day one of you know oh, scout team in, in college so <laughs> yeah did you get you know, just one season with him uh, I, I had two, yeah, two I had with two him. with okay. Khalil, Khalil and them, yeah, so it was, yeah, it was, it was a rude awakening, and, you know, I remember day one, uh, after practice, I ended up calling my mom, and calling my mom and dad, and I was like, I don't think, I don't know if I'm gonna make it, guys, you know, this is a new <laughs> position for me, and, you know, at the time, I didn't really know, I knew who he was, obviously, you'd look at him, and, yeah, you know, you're intimidated at first, but I didn't know the magnitude of the caliber of player he was, so, but, you know, uh, go, going up against him, that was, you know, the best thing for me and, you know, made me better for it. Definitely. That's pretty cool. So I wish Michael was here for this little factoid I want to give you because he went to school at Mount Union where, okay. uh, you know, Lance Leopold, he, he coached at Wisconsin Whitewater. And yeah. I mean, they've, Mount Union and Wisconsin <laughs> Whitewater, those are like the only two teams that ever play for a D3 national championship, it seems like. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so you talked about, you know, Khalil Mack and maybe not realizing in the moment that, you know, what the magnitude of how great of a player he was. When did you start to kind of first realize that you had a chance to play in the NFL? Um, you know, growing up, uh, you know, I always had it in my mind that, um, you know, I, I wanted to be a professional athlete. You know, just growing up, I didn't know what sport I wanted that to be in. But, um, you know, I think high school football – we had a really good year my junior year. Um, I think that's the point where I knew that I could, um, you know, that I could do it and that, you know, that's what I really wanted to do. And I kind of devoted all my time. And, you know, from that point on, I kind of changed my perspective on, you know, how I'm going to, how I'm going to handle, you know, just on the field, off the field stuff. And, you know, all the way through high school and, and college, I, I feel like I sacrificed and, and gave up a lot and sort of just dedicated everything to reaching that goal of wanting to be a professional athlete. And, you know, I, I work day in and day out in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I read you were originally supposed to be picked by the Eagles. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, um, draft day, you know, day three of the draft, you never know where you're going to end up. Um, but you know, I, I have a great agent in Joe Linta and, uh, yeah, we, we kind of had a plan set out that if I didn't get picked in the draft that, um, that I was going to go to Philly. Um, and you know, it, it got a little later in the draft and you know, that day in itself was crazy, but it got a little later in the draft and I knew that Philly didn't have a seventh round pick. Um, so he had actually called me around pick 245. Yeah. And he's like, Hey, like, you know, I got your contract. They faxed it over to him. And, um, you know, once the draft was over, I was ready to sign, you know, he's going to fax that over to me and I would have signed my contract right then and there. And, wow. um, so I was with my entire family down in Florida at the time. And, you know, I got off the phone with Joe and I told my whole family, I was like, guys, you know, at that point, I didn't think I was going to get picked. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I just told basically all of them that, Hey, I'm, I'm probably going to be a Philadelphia Eagle and, I kind of saw a little disappointment and, you know, in their eyes and even in my own, you know, I've, I wanted to get picked in the draft, obviously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no more than like, it was probably like five minutes later, you know, I get a 513 area code phone call and, you know, I have a few, you know, uh, family from Cincinnati and, you know, teammates from Cincinnati. So I kind of recognize the area code and, mm-hmm. you know, sure enough, I picked it up and it was Marvin Lewis. So, um, yeah, so we, you know, we kind of saw, that Cincinnati had a pick left and at 251 and 
you know, everybody was just screaming and it was a, it was a moment that I'll never forget. That's, that's, that's great. That's a, that's a great story. You know, at, um, so I want to, let's take what you said there and, and go back to kind of growing up, you know, near Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Were you a, you know, are you a Browns fan growing up? <laughs> no. So I, um, my dad was always a big Raiders fan. Okay. You know, he grew up watching George Blanda and Kenny Stabler and, you know, Dave Casper and those guys. So actually when I was born, I was brought home in a Raiders, uh, you know, like one piece pajama wow. uh, thing. So <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up being a Raiders fan and you know, I was kind of forced into it. So yeah, I was, I was really interested to see, you know, cause I mean, we, I root for any Ohio team really, but it would be so different <laughs> if you grew up a Browns fan and then got, you know, picked, picked up by the Bengals. But, um, so what's been the, the biggest difference that you've seen between the college game and the pros? Um, I would say a lot of people would say the physical aspect of it, but, um, you know, me personally, I I would have to say the mental side of things, um, you know, just, just within each play, there's so many different, you know, things that change and moving parts and, you know, just being able to read the defense and, um, you know, I I just think there's a whole nother level of, you know, film study that goes into it and, you know, things of that nature. So, you know, that's, that's one thing that was, you know, a, kind of a struggle at first was you know the mental side of things and um just something that you have to take pride in moving forward yeah so like how much time in a typical week would you say was spent like watching film versus you know actually practicing for an nfl player yeah so um i mean so we're at the stadium at you know eight o'clock every morning and you know we don't we don't get done until like five um and our practices are only you know, tops two hours. So, you know, other than like the eating time and, you know, all that, it's, it's, it's mainly all meeting time and film study and, you know, just kind of taking care of our body. But, you know, I'd say 60 to 70% of our day is, um, you know, just film study and, wow. you know, knowing to get your, knowing, um, studying your opponent. Yeah. I can only imagine how in depth it gets when you spend that much time and it's, you're only preparing for, the next opponent. Right. Um, so, uh, my next question here. So with the full off season ahead of you now, are you, are you planning on working out with any other bangles? I know I read a quote that, um, you know, Eifert was a tight end that you had always looked up to and tried to, you know, kind of mold your game into what he does. And I think he, I don't know specifically, but I'm assume, you know, he's, he's a great athlete. He's probably one of those, you know, it seems like a lot of tight ends these days have like a good, really good basketball background. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And, he's a big. He's got a big basketball background for yeah. sure. So, do you, you know, do you work out with any of those guys in the off season or in contact with those guys? Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm in Boca Raton, Florida, training. You know, that's where I train for uh, combine and pro day stuff. Um, and I've been coming down here for you know three or four years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, any chance I get. Um, so we have, you know, I'm, I'm working out basically one on one with Anquan Bolden right now. Okay. You know, until, until most of the other guys get back. But, you know, Pierre Garcon's down here and, you know, I met Travis Kelsey a few years ago. Chris Carter is always down here teaching us stuff. And, you know, so it's a, it's a world class, world class training facility. Um, but like, you know, a few of my teammates, Carl Lawson, I trained with him in the off season. Um, he was used down here for the pro day and combine stuff as well. And, uh, Darquez Dinar trains at our XB facility and, you know, just a ton of NFL guys. Um, and then I actually, uh, so Tyler Eifert, I actually reached out to him today. Yeah. He's training at the facility, like right across the street from us, which I didn't know at first. <laughs> so I'll, I'll definitely be in contact with him here in the future. Good. Okay. That's, that's, that's interesting to hear that, you know, you, I hear a lot of like, in the off season, you know, all the NBA players flock to LA. So it seems like is yeah. Florida kind of like that for, for football. Yeah, there's, there's a few, you know, top notch facilities in Florida and, you know, I'm just lucky to be at one of them. But the, yeah, I say, you know, Florida's a big uh, spot. Actually, there's a, there's a very good training facility in Cincinnati and then there's a few out in California. They're, they're honestly all kind of spread out throughout the yeah. country, but yeah, there's a few really, really good ones in Florida. Okay. So I want to um, run through some some rapid fire questions I have here. 
Um, okay. Favorite TV show at in the mo at the moment. The Office. The Office. Well, always and forever be the yeah, <laughs> no doubt. The Office. <laughs> yeah, it's a that's a no brainer. Uh, best yeah. movie you've seen recently? Oh, best movie. Jeez, I honestly haven't even watched a whole lot of movies. Yeah. I, I watched The Equalizer the other day on TV. That's about okay. It. <laughs> Uh, who out of your rookie class or, or maybe position group have you bonded yeah. with the most in Cincy? Uh, I'd say Seathan Carter. He was our, uh, he was the other rookie. He was a rookie fullback they kept. Um, yeah, we were, we were roommates going into it. So we kind of, you know, we got to know each other really well and you know, it's, it'll probably be a friendship that'll last for a, a while. So, yeah. Okay. And then give me your, your best restaurant in Cincy or, or maybe like a top three if you can't choose just one. Yeah, oh, Pontiac Barbecue. It's Pontiac on, uh, Barbecue. Yeah, it's right, right in the middle of downtown, and yeah, it's it's a great barbecue spot. Okay, well, um, that's all. That's all the questions I have. Thank you so much for taking the time. It was great talking to you. Um, yep, you're welcome. I appreciate you having me. Oh yeah, no problem. Well, I'll definitely have to. You know, since I'm in Columbus, so since he is is not that far away, I'll definitely come down and make it for a, for a game. And, and um, cool. I know you're recovering from a, from an injury right now, but uh, yeah. we wish you the the best of luck in, in next year and uh, hope you guys Thank have you. a successful season. Yes, sir, I appreciate it. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, Mason. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Wow, yeah, so what a great interview from uh, Cincinnati Bengals tight end Mason Shrek. Um, you know, Bill, you and I have talked about it quite a few times on the pod uh, in the past, but, you know, I think it's it's so interesting in the way that sports media is developing. Like, we all have watched the game on Sundays for years, but as it develops and as our generation kind of is thirsty for more information, we want to see that side of athletes. We want to see – what their upbringing was and, and when they first realized, you know, I could be a, I could be a professional athlete. And it it was super interesting to, to kind of relate to a a smaller town kid like Mason that had a similar upbringing kind of to us. The only difference is he had elite athletic ability. (laughs) Uh, We wait, wait, are you saying we didn't have elite athletic ability? I'll say we didn't have as elite of ability. So he was just kind of that next nine notches up the pole. So right, uh, but yeah, it's just it's super interesting to me because I think that's that's where the media world can really develop and show these other sides of the guys of what are they what are they doing Monday through Saturday, right? What's right. The typical like for them? So anyway. Big thanks to him. Um, hopefully he's a, he's a reoccurring guest on Here We Go Cleveland uh, because just a great interview. Yeah, that'd be great to continue to get his perspective. And, you know, like you said, an NFL play is like five to seven seconds, and then you the guys are just standing there for 40 seconds while they get the play call. So it's super short amount that you actually try to get them on the field and to, you know, try and get in the mind of how that person thinks – during those right. five to seven seconds is like, I mean, only guys that can play the game can understand what they go through to prepare for that. And so it was, yeah, like you said, it was really great um, hearing that different perspective. And hopefully um, Mason is a, a, a long time guest. He's always welcome on the Here We Go Cleveland podcast. Yeah, and best of luck. Best of luck this season and, and appreciate him taking the time. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to make our way down to Cincinnati. For a, a game, but uh, let's get into the mailbag question. So, like we said at the beginning of the pod, our dads figured out how to submit. I didn't even know my dad knew how to really email. Um, <laughs> figured it out. That's that's how important the pod is to him. <laughs> figured it out for you. No, but I'm I'm kidding, Dad. If you are listening to this, um, so my dad. Who signed his name Dog Pound Bruce? I didn't know that's what he went by. So this is a new, new <laughs> alter, alter ego. People actually call him that. I don't think people actually. So he wants to know: 
who will the Browns take in the draft? And we've kind of touched on this before, but it's, it's, you know, I don't even know anymore. Because so I'll, I'll just, I'll make mine very simple. So today, cause it's going to change probably 25 times between now and the actual draft. But, uh, actually, Bill, you go first since your dad asked the okay, question. Okay. My dad asked the question. Okay. So, you know, I've seen a lot of experts say that Cleveland, you know, at first when I saw that mock drafts were coming out with Darnold or Allen at the number one pick, um, I thought that they were just assuming that the Browns wouldn't get a free agent. But I started reading some descriptions of why they chose those quarterbacks for the Browns, and it's basic, they basically say, you know, under a veteran present, presence, Darnold or Allen or Mayfield, whoever, will sit for a couple of years and learn behind them and then become the eventual starter. So that completely threw me off as like, oh, would the Browns really still sign, sign a veteran and then still take a number one quarterback? And so, you know, at the beginning of the year, or not the beginning of the year, but, you know, many, many previous pods, we have talked about sign a quarterback and then take, you know, top skill position players at one and four. And I'm starting to come around to the idea that the Browns aren't going to do that. They are going to take one of these top guys just because they don't want to hear, well, they missed on Baker Mayfield or they missed on so-and-so. So I I truly think the Browns are going to, like, trade down the number one pick to, say, like, number two or number three and then take, like, Baker – Mayfield at three, and then take Minka Fitzpatrick at four. That's what I'm feeling. I still think they are going to go with the quarterback. I think some of these mock draft media guys have gotten into my head. How about how about 33 and 35? You can just do position. You know, I, I know think, that's kind of deep, but just I do think, your like, ideal position at that yeah, point. You know, so that. Go quarterback and quarterback and safety, and then so yeah. you know, barring barring any free agency signings, um, I think they have to go right tackle and then like another cornerback at at thirty five. Yeah. So my side again. This is the week of what uh, January twenty ninth. Yep. So this has changed quite a bit. So. As of the week of January 29th, I'm going to say we're going to sign a free agent, a big name free agent in in uh, in a quarterback, and then we're going to go best available. We're going to stay put at one and four, and at this point, I think it would be Saquon Barkley at one and Minka Fitzpatrick at four. So that would be running back and free safety, and then at 33 and 35, I'm with you on a right tackle, and then I would double dip at defensive backfield and get the best corner available. I think it's a really deep cornerback class and yeah. a really deep back class. So if you go if you go corner early, then I think you go running back late. But if you go running back early, which we would do in this scenario, then I think you go cornerback late. So basically it's at one, Saquon, at four, Fitzpatrick, at 33, best available corner, and at 35, a, a right tackle. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, what – I just thought of this. What do you think of – what if the Redskins do a complete complete flip? So they save – say they save $10 million between the difference between Alex Smith and Kirk Cousins. What if they just right back flip Alex Smith to the Browns for the number one pick? Well, so that's – Or the number four pick. That's not that crazy. Of, of a thought, but what I would say is I read because you know with also breaking news Alex Smith got traded to the Redskins. So the, the Washington professional football team. Let's leave, let's leave it at that after the Indians uh, change. Or who lives under a rock and hasn't seen that yet? Um, yeah, that happened on on Tuesday of this week. So uh, anyway, that's not that crazy. However, 
I heard that the reason the Browns didn't get the deal done is because we were we offered a higher pick. We offered one of our three second round picks. Wow. But we weren't willing to sign Alex Smith to the long term extension because clearly Dorsey doesn't believe in Alex Smith as a long term right. option. He was there while he drafted when he traded up seventeen spots to draft Patrick Mahomes. So yeah. Yeah. So I don't think that would happen. However, the logic the logic is there because you would think like just kind of knowing what I know about Jay Gruden and that he's a kind of a control freak type guy. Right. I would think he would do that in a heartbeat to get his his pick, right? His right. guy at right. one. So but I just I I am let the record show I am all in on Kirk Cousins. Pay him whatever he wants. I'm I'm one hundred percent in. So and and then draft a quarterback either either early second round and have two guys that you could potentially hit on long term. I'm I'm a big Kaiser guy, you know that. So know. yeah, if you give him two three years, two years behind Kirk Cousins, he'll be he has a the potential there. So, but anyway, yep. So do you want to head into uh, Merck Senior? Mike yeah, Zappa. let's let's go to and, Mike Zappa Senior. Uh, Merck. Man, best known for teaching me to throw the imperfect spiral. <laughs> Don't grip the his laces, question, right? Yeah. His question of the week to uh, for this week was, what do you think the Cavs need to do? Maybe well, we well, should do a – should we do a dad question of the week segment? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know we if might, they, would, they would want to spend the time thinking of a question every single week, but that sounds like a great segment. We may have to just add that in. So – Anyway, Mike Zappa Sr. asks, what do you think the Cavs need to do? Bring back bring back more talent? Do they fit together anymore? Or can they put it back together for a successful to salvage a successful season? And I think, first of all, great question because that's the question everyone who's a Cavaliers fan is asking themselves right now. Right. As watch them, they're currently up three points on the Miami Heat with 12 seconds left to go in the fourth quarter. So um, where do you even begin with with this question? Because the, the as we know, since LeBron came back, every January has been rough for the Cavs. His first every single year. So I think you kind of expected it this year. But the, the difference in this year and years past, I think, is – the effort is just not there. I mean, they're not getting beat. They're getting blown out by teams. So I just, I think the biggest difference is from this year to last year that people so quickly forget is there's eight new players on this team this year that weren't there last year. There's only yeah. 12 or 15 guys on an NBA roster. What, 12? 15. 15 guys. Active so, guys, yeah. <laughs> turned over half of their team. And I just think that in the past, the, the makeup of the team has, has been, has been old, older, older guys, older players, but they've all been focused around one goal. And they've known that, look, I might have to sacrifice minutes. I may have to sacrifice, you know, my ego and, and check it at the door. But I know at the end of the day, we're all in line. And they had guys to keep them in line, like, Jefferson, Channing Fry, James Lucky. Jones, yeah, James, James Jones, and and even a couple years ago, Kendrick Perkins. I think Kendrick Perkins was huge to that team because he was like, guys, shut up! Like, if right. you, like this is about winning a title or competing for a title. It's not about Isaiah getting his next big contract or Derrick Rose getting his next big contract. Like, yeah. that's not, but it is, it is about Isaiah getting his uh, video from the Celtics. No one knows when that's going to happen yet, but yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, I think that it's it's really hard to go back to the question without getting too side sidetracked. I think it's going to be really hard with the current team as it's made up to salvage the season. At this yeah. point, I'm nervous like of a of a first or second round bounce from the playoff because I just. I don't think that the the way the team is currently made up. I mean, LeBron can only do so much, and right. he doesn't he doesn't have Kyrie anymore to to average or to put up you know a consistent twenty eight points. Right. Like so. Yeah, you get him against a, a weirdly hot like Milwaukee Bucks team. Yeah. Or yeah, 
I mean, so I think I think that February eighth is the NBA trade deadline. So to answer my dad's question, I think they're going to have to make a pretty pretty aggressive move to change not only not only the, the lineup, but to change a little bit the culture. Get some if they could add add a veteran presence with with the mindset of a Jefferson or James Jones or Channing Fry. If they could add a guy like that and at the same time pick up a younger, good perimeter defender, I yeah. think it's I think it's worth it. And in if if in there you can somewhat trim some of the fat that we have, and by fat I mean J.R. Smith, Iman Shumper, Tristan Thompson. J.R.'s Hennessy bottle. Yeah. Even even Isaiah Thomas. So I have <laughs> I haven't completely given up on the Cavs yet, but it's it, they have tested they have tested my my patience greater than they have in past years. Yeah, so. I mean, great job answering uh, Mike Senior's question. Love it. Um, I just want to say a couple things. You know, it's it's just funny to me at this point how like this this happens every single year. And the Cavs drama just like continues to build and build and build. And it's like, it's kind of funny that the Cavs are freaking out so much because it's like every year you guys are in this situation. And every yeah. year you freak out. And, and the past couple of years they really haven't done too much at, at the trade deadline. I mean, 2014-15 season, that's when they got um, JR and Shump and uh, Richard Jeff and um, – it's just so funny. I mean, it's like Derrick Rose is out there talking about, I'm only here to win a championship. It's like, what do you know about what it takes through the season to win a championship? You should be here trying to make a name for yourself again after you came back from so many injuries and get yeah. your next paycheck. You shouldn't be worried. You shouldn't be worried, Derrick Rose, about winning a championship. And that's just funny to me. And it's like, it's funny also to see how – Isaiah reacts to – because for some reason the Cleveland sports media, and I don't know if it's because there's so much buzz around LeBron, but they love to create stories and create stuff that like is maybe just a hint of a rumor, but they go all in on the story. And I think during a press conference, some a reporter asked Isaiah a question, and he's like, you guys are really like reporting on this? Like this is actually a thing? I, I don't know what the context was, but just, like, funny to see how Isaiah handles, like, the random drama that comes up at being LeBron's teammate, more or less. Right. Right. So, anyway, I get, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. The Cavs, the game just finished up, so they did win. They beat the Miami Heat tonight, um, which which is good. But, uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. So, there you go, Dad. Hopefully that answers your uh, your question and uh, keep them coming. Yeah, We'd love to answer more. So keep them coming. We'll, you know, if there is a dad segment, um, if you want to uh, hook me up with skits at some point, yeah, by all, you know, just around the corner, more than happy to to join you there. So <laughs> I'll take happen. a I'll take a vending machine. Um, <laughs> so Owen Owen sent in a mailbag question. He's been on before. And I think he just officially did this so he could get a free T-shirt, even though he tried to keep telling him that that friends don't get free T-shirts for the mailbag. But um, he officially sent a question in, so he's going to get a T-shirt. But his first question, I guess not in his order, but he asked, can you guys please rip on the Cavs hard? They suck. Let America know. Well, Owen... Just so you know, we let more than just America know. I think we have listeners in France and Namibia. I don't know who you are, but keep listening to keep Owen wrong about just letting America know that the Cavs are just a, a disgrace, a disgrace, are- and a destructive train to watch right now. They're in the words of literally the infamous. Shannon Sharp, they are hot garbage. <laughs> and I hate the fact that I'm referencing Shannon Sharp. However, he called them hot garbage, and I had to agree at the moment. But, hey, they won it's, tonight. So hopefully – you know what fixes everything in sports? Winning. So winning. if they just 
if they just go on a nice, you know, 10 of 15 or 10 of 13 type run, then everyone will be like, oh yeah, the Cavs are going to beat the Warriors or the right. Cavs, Cavs are destined. So they play the, uh, the Rockets on Saturday at, at you know, night primetime ABC game. So that's going to be, uh, you know, James Harden just put the, the first ever 60 point triple double up. So that's going to be a true test of, of, where this, I mean, the last tough game they actually played, no offense to the Pacers and the Pistons and the Heat, but, you know, Spurs, that was kind of a, a hard, I don't even know, a, a weirdly hard fought loss. And then the, the most prominent game before that was the, the Thunder drubbing. Um, yeah. so it'll be really interesting to see where this team's at, um, without Kevin Love for yeah. the next six to eight weeks against the, the Rockets. So. Yeah. So we'll do the best, Owen, to keep keep people up to speed internationally of how the Cleveland Cavs are performing, whether they're achieving at par or underachieving. Right now they're clearly underachieving compared to the talent they have. Let's let's run through Owen's other questions pretty quickly because okay. we got a loaded show. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll the Olympics real quick. Owen absolutely agree that, you know, typically – February is one of the drag months of the year. January is the worst month of the year, followed by February. That's fact. That's not up to opinion anywhere. <laughs> At but least every- in Ohio. I mean, maybe they don't even really matter in, like, L.A. But Yeah. But every four years, I, I think it's still in L.A. Because the, the time from January 1st to the next national holiday, it, right. well, you the government, so it's different. But for us all. <laughs> private sector folk, the time from January 1st to the next private holiday that's recognized in the private sector is the longest span in any span yeah. in, of the months of, of the year. So, what, do you, what do you get, like just January 1st and Memorial Day? Is that your next one? Or? Basically, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's five Come to the months. dark side. Come to the dark side. Drain the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Owen, absolutely agree. Every four years, we're blessed with the Winter Olympics, and we will we will devote more time to this in next week's pod. I, I promise you that because I do want to dive into it a little bit. But since we've had since we had uh, a pretty loaded show today, unless Bill, you wanted to. Well, you know, I just want to I just want to ask a couple questions. What are your give me your top two Winter Olympic sports? Let's start with that. We'll break it down um, later next week, as Michael said. But give me your what's your top two Olympic sports to watch? Well, I mean, I think, I think skiing, um, I don't know the, the proper name for it. Um, is it the, but, bi- is it the shooting skiing, the biathlon? Yeah. Yes. The shooting skiing, you have to put up there. And I'm going to, I'm going to stick to skiing for my second also because I just watched some qualifiers last weekend. And I was just fascinated by, by the whole, the whole process. Yeah. Downhill, like, like obstacle skiing. Oh yeah. The slalom, the giant slaloms and everything. Yeah, is is fascinating to me because they're going they're going like 50, 60 miles an hour the whole whole way down. So, uh, but also the the super whatever Sean White does the super pipe or whatever. Yeah, I don't know what they call it now. There's so many things. The X Games double flip quadra pipe or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So any any of the skiing or snowboarding events, I mean, are are just fantastic. So, yeah. and, and obviously. Shout out to Disney movies of 1990s, the bobsled. I mean, oh. you got to be in on the bobsled. That's that's one of my personal. Just because I like it's the you know like the bobsled, the luge, and the skeleton. Those are the only only things that like just make me make me uneasy about the people. Because like skiing, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles down the hill, you can train for that. And I know there's some some rough injuries that can happen, but. It's just it's just skiing at a very very high level, but like luge and skeleton, that scares the living shit out of me. Watching yeah. those guys go down. I mean, I'm looking at a picture right now of a guy on a skeleton. It's literally just a flat black board, maybe <laughs> the, maybe the size of like from your the bottom of your abs to your neck, and it's on two skis, and you're just flying down this ice track. And that's just completely insane. 
But, you know, I agree, snowboard is great. I love to watch the cross-country skiing just because I know that America sucks at it and they have not been very good at cross-country skiing. And I just always – that's like the one sport that America is like the true, true underdog in is because like it's always the Norwegians or it's always the, you know, the Scandinavian countries that that win those. And it's fun to just watch the American guy struggle to stay in 15th place the entire race. Yeah. So – um, I'm, I'm super pumped for him though, because it's, it's endless entertainment for two and a half, three weeks. Oh yeah. So. And since it's in Korea, um, I mean, you can get up any time of the day and start watching something. I mean, you get up yeah. in the middle of the night, you have to go to the bathroom. You just bring out your phone and look, there's some curling going on. Yeah. So, and, and, so again, I definitely want to get a little bit more into um, the Olympics. Yeah, we're next. gonna have full medals prediction um, next week. First, second, third, and any dark horses. I mean, sorry, gold, bronze, gold, silver, bronze, any dark horses um, for every event. Um, compliments of Owen. If he, if he sponsors that segment, we'll do that. Perfect. Perfect. So, so let's go into his last question. Or do you want? So we're going to do a Super Bowl preview here very, very, very shortly. I know everyone is itching for us to get to the Super Bowl preview. So do you want to leave Owen's last question, which is, who are you rooting for for in the Super Bowl? And he doesn't necessarily limit that to a specific team, um, but maybe players or coaches or, or what's going to happen. So do you want to save that question until at the very end of the Super Bowl when we kind of give our picks and everything? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Super Bowl is here. This is what, um, well, probably not Browns fans' entire seasons culminate to, but this is, um, you know, the very culmination of the Here We Go Cleveland podcast is is the Super Bowl, and we're here to bring um, as much of a Cleveland perspective on this Super Bowl as we can. So we have a very unique perspective because you lived in Philly for yeah. part of your life, and yeah. so just just um, first, let me let me give a shout out to the Philadelphia fans because in a larger market, really, I don't know that there's a city I visited that is close to like the the mantra of Ohioans and Clevelanders than than there is in in the people in Philly. So. Um, I just want to give a small shout out because I, I might have mentioned that I, he's going to be listening for the first time this week. Anthony Slusher was my roommate when I lived <laughs> in, in Philly. Big, biggest Eagles fan, his whole family, huge Eagles fans. But anyway, they, Philly is such a city like, like Cleveland that, I mean, it's a blue collar town built on manufacturing, like, uh, very, very hardworking, good people, and they an hour hour drive from Dunder Mifflin. Yeah, an hour drive from Dunder Mifflin, probably most importantly. So, um, you have you have to pull for for a city and for a team like that that has been so deprived the last. I mean, they've they've had some decent Eagles teams in the last you know five to ten years, but overall the Sixers have been garbage. Yeah. Um, the the flyers have not been good so you it's probably one of the few fan bases that that can resonate with with Cleveland's pain i don't know that i could i could think of others and i mean that that's the type of city that throws beer bottles at santa claus right like nothing <laughs> nothing encompasses a fan base other than like just destroying santa claus when when they dress up as one so um, I obviously have a, I have a bias towards Philly, having spent a little time there and, and having met a lot of people there. But um, I'm really, really pulling for the Eagles in my heart. However, heart, dun, dun, dun. insert insert uh, Darth Vader music. Yeah. However, I've been fooled one too many times to ever bet against Tom Brady. <laughs> so as a, as it stands right now. I could I could not put money on the Eagles. I couldn't do it just because you know, not to talk too much about the the AFC Championship game. I just 
I watched the whole thing and not for a second did I think Tom Brady wasn't going to pull it out. So it, this has been a magical season for the Eagles, no doubt. And, and they, their future is so bright with Carson Wentz being in his second year this year. Their next 15 seasons are going to be bright with that guy. So I, I am really excited, um, to see, to see the game. But I'm not so excited to see the outcome. Yeah, I mean, because, it, you know, you look at Brady and he goes right along with Bill Belichick. And those two guys have just been at this high of a level for so long. I mean, none of the Eagles players know how to handle any of the media stuff. Doug Peterson doesn't know exactly what to tell his coaching staff on Saturday night to get prep before the game. Um, none of these guys, you know, maybe they'll simulate a longer break during practice for halftime and they'll do these little things, but, but no one like Brady and Belichick especially knows how to coach his team so that they take the, the smallest things that he notices in the Super Bowl that can completely flip a game and just drive those points home. And I yeah. think that's the biggest advantage that you can have is, you know, like I said, Belichick knows what to tell his coaches on Saturday night. He knows how to show his game plan and and get it through their heads, what they're going to do, every situation, what happens here, what happens here. Um, and he is so strategic. It's It's been said time and time again, but like, Belichick is playing chess and everyone else in the NFL is playing checkers. Yeah. And he sees six, six moves ahead and, um, it's, and he sees six moves in the, in reverse to try and see how to get six moves ahead. So, so are you, are you a fan of the dynasty? Does it bother you? Do you like, it does not bother me one bit because Belichick came from Cleveland. Brady came out of nowhere. They were, you know, if you talk to Patriots fans, they were a Cleveland before they became this dynasty. You know, they hadn't won in forever. They got so lucky that Robert Kraft gave Belichick his chance to implement all that he did and hire all the people that he did. And it's just... I don't think they really knew what they were creating in the beginning, but it's become such a storied dynasty that I just, I, I can't hate them because I just respect what they do so much because just as a, a football like nerd, I, I get what Belichick does. Just, he's a genius. Okay. And, and so I have two questions for you that I want you to answer instinctively, impulsively. Without thinking, just whatever okay. comes. Okay, they have to be like one or two word answers. Did Brady make Belichick or Belichick make Brady? Go. I think okay, okay. Brady, Belichick. Okay, shit. Brady made Belichick because I think that Belichick isn't. There was a, a Ringer podcast talked about this earlier today. Is that would if you could take shout out uh, Kevin Clark and, and Robert Mays, but if you could take Belichick and place him, replace him with literally any coach in the NFL, whether that be head coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, special teams, would there be a team that would say would, would there be a position that he would not replace? And the only thing that they could come up with was offensive coordinator because he is much more of a defensive scheme guy than than anything else. So I think Belichick may have put the initial system in, but like Josh McDaniels calls the plays. And Brady, I mean, he's done it for this long. It's just I think if Belichick left, Brady would still be who Brady is. But if Brady left, Belichick would not still be as successful as he is. Because I, I think if you asked 
if you asked a hundred people that question, I think you'd be split fifty fifty. Oh yeah, it's such a tough thing. It's Basically, the chicken and the egg. I mean, I don't even know yeah. why people are asking the chicken and the egg question anymore. They should just be asking the Brady Belichick question. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, in my second question that I just want, I just want a couple word answer is, what is more impressive of a run, or or maybe not impressive is the word, but a more rare run. The amount of disappointment that the Browns have consistently delivered for the last 18 years, 19 years, or the Patriots dynasty since 2001. Because I would argue, the reason I ask is because I would argue that in the NFL, a league built to go 8-8, eight and eight, right? Between right. South right. Cap and between the draft and stuff like that. I would argue that it's more rare for the anti dynasty to occur. No, I that's that's my answer. I I agree with you that it's so much more rare that the Browns are as bad as they are because because they've been trying. They've, they've been, been trying. They have been trying and like early like say 20 years ago, the league maybe wasn't built for as much mediocrity as it is for today. There were much, there was much more gap between the best teams and the low teams. Not saying that the low teams always, you know, won one or two games, but those teams that were three and 13 or two and 14 were so much worse than teams that were eight and eight or nine and seven. And then those teams were just not even in the picture with teams that went 11 and five or, or 13 and three up there. So, and it's slowly decreased, even though the records stay the same, you know, the Pats still win 12 games a year. It's really the talent level all across the NFL and just a few other things like, you know, free agency has really opened up and um, there's rule changes that have opened things up and it's just the gap between the bottom. And I think, uh, you know, if you look at like advanced stats, the gap between the bottom NFL team and defensive DVOA and the top NFL team this past season was the shortest range that it's been since they started tracking those stats. So everything has become like, it's just, that's why it makes it so crazy that a team can't jump up and become not just horrendous. Yeah, exactly, and and that's that's my argument as well. Is it's it's not as if they've made an active attempt to tank. I mean, they've they've constantly changed head coaches, constantly tried to he- change things up to to take the next step. So as impressive as the Patriots dynasty has been for the last seventeen, eighteen years. Let's just uh, give a little credit where credit is due for the anti-dynasty. Right, and the only way that you can be successful, like failure leads to success, right? The only way you know how to succeed is to fail. And so does that mean that the Browns are going to become the the Pats? This this is a Here We Go Cleveland exclusive. (laughs) This this is a hot take. Hot take. Cleveland. So according to the podcast, as of today – after the Super Bowl this Sunday is when the tides change, and the Patriots. I think after I think the Patriots will win this game, and Brady will retire. Belichick, Belichick may do the same, but the Patriots dynasty will legitimately start to deteriorate, deteriorate as the Cleveland Browns dynasty begins to build. Yes, you heard it here first, folks. I love it. I love it. But I mean, it, the Patriots, you know, they show you, like, they have gotten super, super lucky because they've had Belichick the whole time. They've only lost Brady to one season. One season and, and four deflate gate games. Oh, yeah. Um, so they've had him the entire time. They've, been able to keep Josh McDaniels and Matt Patricia, who are great offensive defensive coordinators that 
seems like other leagues, other teams around the league for the past four to six years could use those guys as coaches. I know McDaniels yeah. went to the Broncos, but then he came back to the Patriots. So they've been very lucky to keep that core around them. And, you know, the Browns have not kept any core um, really around them. So, I mean, only only Joe Thomas um, has been there. So It starts this Sunday. Starts this Sunday. As soon as the Super Bowl ends? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm pumped for that. It's going to start with Kirk Cousins. You watch. <laughs> so the only one – okay, so we, we ripped that off. The only other thing I really want to say about Philadelphia is that they – I think they have an actual – so if they play from behind and they slow the Pats down, I think that's how they win the game because if it becomes a shootout, then it's it's Tom Brady versus Nick Foles, and that's not yeah what what's good for the Eagles. So if they can slow this game down and the Eagles have a great pass rush – they have great secondary that can hold everyone in line. They have their, I love their offensive line. They, these guys are so athletic. Um, yeah. if you look at their, so their right tackle is Lane Johnson. He's 6'6", six, six, like 300 some pounds. He ran the same 40 as one of the Patriots linebackers. I mean, these guys are just massive and they scheme them in different ways that makes the, they're, they're at lines, athleticism, just so much more prominent and dominant um, over these games. And so let's let's wrap it up with, with our final picks. But I want to get into a couple prop bets, um, hopefully before your computer doesn't die. But so Eight stri- straight up, straight up money line, who are you taking? The Pats are favored by four and a half right now. The original line was six. So a lot of money people have been putting money on the Eagles, but straight up, who are you taking? Wait, so straight up meaning straight up no spread, no spread. You know, I've I've honestly in this pod talked myself into taking fly Eagles fly. Let's go. Can uh, Can Anthony come on and do the whole uh, E A G L E S Eagles fight song for us? If if they win, he he will be on. I will <laughs> be on. That'd be awesome. That'd be perfect. Yeah, I think you bring up a few good points. So I'll just keep it short. But you know, Belichick is known around you know football for taking away your best offensive option on defense, right? So I think I think between Garrett Blunt and Jay Ajaje, I think they have a really good running game. But at the same time, they have a really good receivers in Alshon Jeffrey and tight end in Zach Ertz. And the Aguilar who can kind of take the top off. So I think, you know, it's going to be kind of pick your poison. And if you want to take away, if you want to take away that run game, then you're going to have to deal with, with the, the receivers. And as, as I said, I never thought the Jaguars would, would win that game. They were still in it. I mean, they're very much in it. Yeah, so I don't think the Eagles' defense is quite as good as the Jaguars because obviously the Jaguars spent like a hundred million dollars on their starting eleven players on defense. But yeah. I think I think net net the Eagles are a better team because of because of how good they are on offense and how good they are on defense. So um, those are some really good points that you brought up. And so yeah, I'm I'm rolling with the Eagles straight up. Kill Straight. It. That's awesome. I, you know, I think straight up, just picking the game, I have to go Pats because, you know, I'm I'm so excited to watch Fletcher Cox play in a big game. I'm so excited to watch uh, Malcolm Jenkins. He's going to be unbelievable in this big game. Tim Jernigan. Um, the, the whole Eagles off defense just gets me excited. But... They have only – their defense has only faced 56 passes all year when they are trailing. And if New England gets ahead – New England is great at 
not letting teams come back, but also coming back from any kind of deficit. So if this game is anything within a 14 point, you know, say Philadelphia has a 14 point lead with 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter, there's no way, no way that after everything the Pats have done that you can rule them out. So I think this game is going to be much closer than that. And I think the Pats have the magic in them still to pull this victory off. Now, that being said, so I'm taking the Pats, but that being said, Straight the Eagles, up. The straight Eagles up. have... We're not counting spread. No, we're not counting spread. I'm taking the Pats straight up. Um, but I would take the Eagles on that, you know, minus four and a half. Eh, that, that's a little tricky there. If it was still at maybe minus five and a half or six... I would take the Eagles, but I still take the Pats over the spread with at minus four and a half on on most of the betting websites. Gotcha. You got any prop bets for us? To yeah, so it? let's let's run through some of my best bets here. I I am no um, professional gambler. I'm not even an amateur gambler. I'm not offering advice to anyone. These are just some good odds that I saw on Bovada. Um, Shout out Bavada if you want to sponsor us, go right ahead. So the best, more some of the best bets I saw: Eagles up at halftime, Pats winning the game. That's plus four seventy five. That's a gr- that's great odds if you think the Eagles are going to come out firing, and and the Pats are like always going to come back at some time and win that game. Yeah, I can see that. Happening. The other best bet I have is uh, Super Bowl MVP. Any if you are an Eagles fan and you think they're going to win, you should put some money down on literally anyone on the Eagles to win the MVP because Tom Brady has like minus 200, 210. Uh, I think Nick Foles is at plus 375. And everyone has better odds than that to win you more money back. So if you're a fan of the Eagles, you know, go Fletcher Cox, go Malcolm Jenkins. I think those guys are like plus 10,000, something ridiculous like that. Michael, I know the guy that you were most looking forward to, Kenny Britt. He's in the field, actually, because he somehow got on the pass. I have no idea how Bill Belichick came and, uh, you know, gave a phone call to him to get him on the team. But he's plus 2,200 with it within the field to win Super Bowl MVP. Bill, you stole my thunder. I, I was waiting until the very end of the pod so that I could say, and the player I'm looking most forward to watching is Kenny Britt on the sideline in a, ah. a gym suit. That's all he's going to be wearing. But anyway, yeah, no, that's that's a good that's a good um, recommendation though to put some money on an eagle because I mean there's probably only three or four players if you really believe the Eagles are going to win right. that could win MVP. He, you know, Nick Foles or or others. Right. You know. So let's look up. Let's do some more prop bets. Those are just some general field bets. The prop bets are king of the Super Bowl nowadays. Um, there's over a thousand prop bets on Bovada. Seriously ridiculous. So give me your. Let's do some quick fire takes here. National anthem over under two minutes. Under. Under. I think yeah. I think under two. I think. If you look at the past 12 Super Bowls, it's it's like exactly two minutes on average. So um, let's look at the Gatorade color. We've got lime green and yellow with the the best odds at plus 225, orange at plus 300, and then the super, super underdog purple at plus 1,000. For the players, the benches? For the – for when a team – when a coach gets some kind of Gatorade dumped on them, what color is that going to be? You can bet on that. You can you can bet on that. In purple is minus one thousand. It's plus plus one thousand. So if you bet ten dollars, you're gonna win a thousand dollars. Oh my gosh, purple, yeah, <laughs> purple for sure. Somehow clear or slash water had better odds than purple, and I was like, I don't think teams do like non-colored Gatorade anymore. I don't think there'd be a clear dumping of a coach yeah okay so let's move on here pink will pink be airborne during her national anthem performance no no, no. okay 
You wouldn't don't I I wouldn't bet on this. If you think yes, I mean you can you got plus three hundred, but it, no is minus five hundred. So you have to pay a lot of money to win any kind of prize on that. Uh number of Trump tweets is at over under five during the game. Over. I think over two, but don't bet on that. It's it's minus one fifty for both over or under. It's nothing worth your time. Just a funny thing that you can literally bet on how many Trump tweets there'll be during a game. And then the last one that's that's near and dear to my heart as a nineties kid and your heart too, I'm sure. Will an NSYNC member perform with Justin Timberlake? Plus two hundred odds for yes. 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 I think yes too. I mean, it seems like these past Super Bowls has all has all been about collabs and bringing. I mean, Beyonce brought out Destiny's Child and yeah. all these different things. So I just think that maybe the entire NSYNC. I mean, you can't bet on that, but maybe the entire NSYNC uh, ensemble will show up. Yeah, definitely. I think I think so. So, um, but yeah, if you want to see any any more crazy bets, go to head over to Bovada. There's some ridiculous ones like Will Tom Brady's. You know who has more touchdown pass or what's higher, Tom Brady's touchdown passes or some random ass English Premier League soccer team scoring goals and anything you want to find. So you can bet Kenny Britt for MVP if you want to. Boy. <laughs> so that wraps it up. So you got Eagles straight up, and are you taking the Pats money or with the spread? Or are you go, still sticking Eagles? Eagles straight up. Eagles, Eagles all the way. All right, I'm taking I'm taking the the Pats straight up, but I I think I would take the Eagles with like a, a five and a half point spread. I think it's going to be a really close game. I think. Even with Nick Foles, Philadelphia's offense has the right strengths where New England's defense has some weaknesses. So I, I'm really excited to watch it. Um, can't wait to see any, any, all the commercials and, um, how many times Nipplegate is said during the, uh, broadcast. <laughs> Heck yeah. Be sure <laughs> to, uh, to subscribe to us on iTunes or SoundCloud or Stitcher, right? Yep. Stitcher, while supplies last, we're still doing the t-shirt promotion. Is that correct, Bill? That is definitely correct. We uh, so, I guess we'll get our, our dad's t-shirts out shortly in the mail. Owen, you too. Yep. So, uh, again, sorry for the long episode, but hopefully it was worth your time. In fact, to our dozens of listeners, I know it was worth your time. You won't regret it. So uh, we look forward to touching base next week. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll be back after the Super Bowl for uh, the big Olympics preview. That's right. Cool. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, Again, I'm Bill Hebel, your host. And I'm Mike Zappa. Have a great week, everyone. Have a great week. Here we go, Cleveland.